Good evening, everyone. I feel like I'm like in the middle of a, an amazing conversation, but we're going to kind of switch gears. Can, can, is this on? Can you hear me? Is it working? You can hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm Sarah Lomax Reese. I'm going to be the moderator for the panel discussion portion of tonight's program. I'm the president and CEO of WURD Radio, which is an African American talk radio station here in Philadelphia. So we wrestle with these issues around race and violence and equity and white supremacy and just, you know, all of these issues on a, on a regular basis. So it's really wonderful to be able to be a part of um, this public classroom that is seeking to not just do a drive-by around this information, but to really dive in deep and to bring some of the, the, the best and the brightest, some of the greatest minds from all over the country to, um, to Penn to, to discuss these topics. And so I'll just introduce the, the panel and then we'll jump into the conversation. And their full bios are in the packet that you received, so I'm just going to um, introduce them by their, their name and title. To my immediate right is, you met already, Dr. Deborah Thomas. She's a professor of anthropology and Africana studies here at the University of Pennsylvania. And to her right is Dr. Oliver Rollins. He's a postdoctoral fellow in the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society here at Penn. And to his right is Dr. Kristen Smith. She is an associate professor of anthropology and African and African diaspora studies at the University of Texas in Austin. And to her right is Paul Eaton. He is the academic director of the Patron Center for the Fair Administration of Justice and a senior fellow at University of Pennsylvania Law School. And then last but definitely not least is Dr. Erin Harrison, and she's an assistant professor um, at the School of Social Welfare at the University of California, Berkeley. So why don't we just start by giving you a warm welcome. Mm -hmm. So thus far, we've gotten a really wonderful kind of academic um, grounding in this issue from an anthropological perspective as well as a historical perspective. And I'm going to kind of fast forward us to right now. <laughs> you know, we are in a highly racialized moment right now, right here at Penn. And um, oh, is my machine not working? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> so this is a question for, for each of you, and we can, you know, start, whoever wants to jump out there first can, can do that. You know, it feels like we have um, just inherited a more violent world. You know, it feels like things have gotten a little bit more violent over the last week, and maybe that means things were subliminally there, but it feels like it just got, uh, the world just got more violent. And a lot of hateful language um, for blacks and Jews and LGBT folks, Muslims, you name it, um, a lot of people are in the crosshairs. And so as we, as we launch this conversation, I wanted each of you to um, share from your perspective and your area of expertise how you view violence and race in the context of this recent election and where we are right now in, in this moment. So whoever wants to kind of step out first. So I'm happy to share a few of my thoughts. So you know, my academic uh, training, uh, reflecting you know, Penn's multidisciplinary nature, is actually an economist. And so I think a lot about what sort of data and information can we bring to bear in thinking about issues of race and violence. Uh, you know, I commend those who are here today because I think part of this conversation, you know, here at Penn and throughout our nation needs to be about coming together and having a common understanding of what, the fa of what some of the facts are surrounding these issues. And then, uh, you know, putting, bringing in our values and interpretation. One of the things that's troubled me 
a lot as someone who thinks a lot about data is some of the discourse that we heard during the election campaign about race and violence. And uh, people were making a lot of claims, for example, that violence is up substantially here in the United States and there are certain groups, immigrants or other groups that are responsible for that. And I think that that actually doesn't square very well with the data, which, uh, for example, shows that as a nation, we're at, you know, near a 30-year low in violent crime. And so, you know, that makes me a little bit pessimistic as someone who relies on data, but also looking forward, perhaps as we move out of this campaign period and we move to more of a, func uh, uh, a focus on how are we going to move forward, uh, there may be more of a role to bring in data and information and those facts as a basis of forming policy and governing. Aaron, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, cynical. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about the response to the election results, um, particularly, I actually came back to Philadelphia to vote last week, um, but I was in Berkeley, California for all of the fallout, aftermath, if you will. Um, and I can't say that I was shocked so much as I was annoyed by the, the, like the, the white liberal guilt and the how could it have happened and what do you mean you didn't vote for Hillary or a vote not for Hillary is a wasted vote or it's a vote for Trump, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the questions that I have or the concerns that I'd like to raise are, are more about individual and collective responsibility, particularly among folks who are privileged um, and may not or simply can't see how they also have to confront different kinds of violence, both direct and interpersonal, as well as uh, structural and violence that manifests at a macro level. Um, and I'm really, I really want to encourage folks of all walks, of all shades, to really sit with that. You know, sort of what is, what is your responsibility for, for racial inequality, for the construction of race, for racial violence, et cetera, et cetera, um, regardless of where you hail or where you think you're headed. Um, and those are, those are questions I don't think we're asking enough. Or maybe not in Berkeley, I don't know. <laughs> it's where I'm at, though. Go ahead, Deb. Well, I was just... Um, you know, going to say that, uh, you know, like everybody on the panel, I think um, it's been incredibly disheartening, not surprising, but disheartening to see um, the forms, the spontaneous forms that the um, violence and racist remarks have taken over the past week. And, um, you know, it's, it's a different kind of gut uh, randomness to the expression, which feels um, more, uh, I don't know, more juvenile in a, in a certain kind of way. Um, but I think also, you know, as Kristen's, as the film that Kristen shared with us just now, showed it's not like this is a phenomenon that's limited to the United States. And certainly if we take the global view that we were taking last week and um, you know that I would encourage us also and I'm sure Kristen and everybody else feels that way as well. Um, you know, we see this as part of a global dynamic, you know, most immediately and obviously uh, we have to relate it to Brexit, we have to relate it to the rise of fascism again in France. I mean this is the rise of the kind of uh, right, the very conservative right, is, is happening at the same time that uh, the rise in overt racism is happening. Um, and state violence against black people in the United States, in Brazil, in Jamaica, and uh, you know many, many other places around the world. So in some ways, this provides an opportunity to think also beyond ourselves and to try to imagine you know, what is the broader uh, rubric in which we can frame recent events and, and therefore what would the broader collaborations possibly be you know, moving forward? Yeah, and um, Kristen? I was struck by the metaphor of the moment of our discussion of the skulls just before this panel 
And for me, it spoke a lot about what we are experiencing in this moment, in this country, and in this world. For years, we have been living on top of bones and ghosts, mm -hmm. buried deep beneath the surface. And we have been walking on them, and we have been trampling on them, and we have not been paying attention to them. And yet, eventually, these things come to the surface. And so, for me, a lot of what we are seeing are the bones coming to the surface, the things we have buried long and deep into the earth that we had forgotten that we wish wouldn't reappear are now reappearing. And I think that we should think about that. And, and we should really take a long look at this moment because clearly burying our sentiments does not make them go away. Eventually they do fester and bubble over. And for me, that's something that, this is, this is a moment that requires pause and reflection. Um, this is not just our moment in the United States either. And so we've, taught, we've heard a lot of talk about Brexit. We've heard a lot of talk about France and what's going on in the Philippines and what might go on in Italy at the, in their upcoming election. But what few people paid attention to was just before the Olympics, you had a basically a hostile takeover of Brazil mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of previous dictatorships where a democratically elected president was deposed based on trumped up charges and impeached, um, bringing back a strong shift to the right, the removal of civil, civil, excuse me, civil liberties, um, the erasure of the welfare state, all of the, all of the um, provisions that people had for things like job rights and union rights and rights to an education have been gutted since then. And so I would really encourage us to not only think about the racial implications here in the United States, which all of the panelists have talked about just now, but also think about this as a global moment. What if this is a global moment? What are we looking at? What if 2016 is much like 1968? How does that change how we think about things? Thank you. And Oliver. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, for someone who stu I study science and study the relationship between race and science, and so uh, and my first project was thinking about how scientists actually study violence and what's the relationship with race. And I think one of the things that, I, I, that came out of that that makes me think of this moment was the ways in which we visualize what, what, what is racial violence. And I think racial violence has to be thought about not simply as uh, the criminalization, I mean, I'm sorry, not simply as the, uh, yeah, the, the, the racialization of crime, thinking that you know, we can look at racial statistics and we can show that a particular group had, is more violent, or I'm sorry, a particular group has been arrested more or a particular group has been, or is, is locked up more, uh, and when we can try to say who is more violent, but it's also the, the, the criminalization of race itself. Uh, that means that particular types of bodies, uh, who, who is actually, uh, how we think about who is violent and who is not. And we saw that all throughout this campaign where certain groups were pinned, where certain groups were pinned as being a violent group. Um, and it, it made me also think about you know, kind of echoing a lot of what's already on the stage is that um, we also need to have a conversation about what American ideals and what safety is about. Um, so, so much of this pent up idea, ideas around particular races being violent has also been a way for those who do support the type of rhetoric that Donald Trump said to feel safe, right? So, um, it's a ways in which these things get pinned together in which one group feels safe or they need that to feel safe. And it, it should actually makes us question our ideas around what democracy, our ideas around what safety means, our ideas around what liberalism means, all of these things, because as Christian just said, these things have always been there, uh, and they kind of just rose to the surface again. And so I feel like the, the stuff that I, you know, that I think about with race, um, with race and crime, and, and the type of, type of rhetoric that was, that was put out there only reaffirmed, only reaffirmed my, my, notion, my thoughts around how we always try to racialize or try to criminalize particular types of bodies, right? And that that, that became another kind of way in which um, uh, another another type of way in which you know we we, we, we have not had a, a real discussion about, um, and that and that's needed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So I'm going to stick with you, Oliver. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm going to ask a question that's probably politically very incorrect. But I, I want you to, to, to dive into it. And the question, and you kind of started touching on it, but is there a, a biological basis for, for violence? Are certain races more violent than others? And I, you know, I know that what you were just saying was based on, on black bodies, the criminalization of black bodies. But when I think about you know, the, 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 the transatlantic slave trade and all that we heard leading up to this, the question of you know, how could a race subjugate another race and subject them to such inhumanity. So you know, I wonder on, on not just around how black people are currently perceived or, or stereotyped, uh -huh. but when you think about just race in general, white people, how could they do it? I mean, is there this biological basis of violence? So um, the short answer to that is no, there is not. Um, and I think you're right around why this question is, why the question in itself is troubling. And I, I would say, you know, part of just even, not just for you asking the question, but the question is asked a lot, but part of the problem with the question is that we're also assuming that race is biological in that, in that, in that moment. So to, to actually say that we can pin out or pull out the biological underpinnings of violence to a particular group means that you have to be able to categorize that group biologically in a particular type of way, which we all will say cannot happen because race is not something that we can use, that, that can be biologically determined. So in part, the answer to the question is it doesn't happen because you can't actually separate these groups out. Race is too dynamic. You know, how we think about race is not biology, so you couldn't just go, even if you found a gene, and there is a gene that they try to link to violence, um, you wouldn't, find that, you wouldn't find it in a particular group, right? Because that would go across groups because there's nothing racially about that, that gene or that group. And so, um, yeah, so the short answer would be no, that there is no biological basis to violence. Now, I, I would add that what's, so the people that I study now who are doing this research would probably argue similarly. They would say there is no quote unquote biological basis, but they would argue um, that there are biomarkers that lead to the risk of violence. So I think the language has changed over the time, and we can, we can debate, and I definitely debate with them around whether or not that's simply saying there's a biological basis, but I think we also, to really, to really be able to you know, take them head on, we have to be able to understand how they're thinking that they're coming about this and how this changes. So they think about it more as risk now, but I think still lingering there is just always these underpinnings around whether or not we're just talking about kind of the criminal man, you know, like that there's something about you being born the way you are that makes you violent. So I, I also, you know, this isn't, this discussion can be very dynamic. So if anybody wants to jump in and um, add to or, or debate, um, feel free. Um, but I, I guess I want to turn to you, Aaron, to talk about kind of environment and structural um, violence. And what does, what are some of the, um, the environmental elements, whether it's housing or healthcare or education that could and do contribute to, to, to or have a, a relationship with violence? Sure. Um, well, what I would say, I should first define what, I'm, what I think of when I think of structural violence, and, and particularly in those domains. So structural violence in housing is um, unaffordable homes that are in disrepair, um, that are built adjacent to either unregulated, or poorly regulated, or deregulated you know, industrial locales. When I talk about structural violence in education that's linked to race, I'm thinking about overcrowded classrooms, school systems uh, in which states have completely divested, ill-conceived voucher programs, the list goes on. Um, and for healthcare, things like um, Flint, <laughs> Michigan, and, and lead-based water. I'm thinking about um, trips to the ER for asthma flare-ups that could easily be addressed, you know, by by regular pediatric content or contact. Excuse me. Um, I'm thinking about food deserts. All these kinds of things. These these are these are violent acts or violent systems, processes, dynamics that are imposed upon racially minoritized groups in the United States and also abroad. Um, and, and that's a kind of violence that needs to be addressed, I'd say more so, or at least with as much rigor as the kind of attention we pay to interpersonal violence, you know, the kinds of environmental and structural violence imposed upon black and brown folks merits just as much attention um, and is just as dangerous and, and sort of 
connected to Oliver's remarks around the biological basis for race is absolutely right, and I completely agree that it doesn't exist, but we do have uh, epigenetic dynamics unfolding. And by that, I'm talking about um, the, the changes in gene expression that exists because of what's happening in environmental spaces. So, so the body actually changes, and, and physicians are, are writing this up now in, in desk manuals, um, acknowledging the way trauma is, is handed down intergenerationally. Um, and that's something we need to think about too, like what is the fallout from, from the 1960s and 2016 and on and on and on and on endured by black and brown bodies that are attributed to what's happening in environmental and structural spaces, but that are engendered from, from individual and collective action, you know, on the ground. So when we, when we start looking at violence in kind of this more holistic framework, and I'm gonna to come to you, Paul, when we, when we look at environment, like housing and, and schools, and, and a lot of this stuff kind of gangs up in communities, and so they, they reinforce each other. And it can lead to, you know, um, things like mass incarceration and police violence and things like that. And so I wanna see, um, Paul, if you can talk a little bit about how um, the, the, some of these structural violence markers manifest and lead to these kind of systemic realities like mass incarceration. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, uh, you know, it's an interesting problem and is part of the broader conversation about race and violence. Uh, violence, I mean, I'm glad you brought up these structural issues because I think one of the areas that really clouds uh, our discourse here in the United States and I think, quite frankly, throughout the world is people's inability to kind of understand or separate and recognize uh, that there's a cluster, you know, uh, violence, be it interpersonal, be it structural, is a very complex phenomenon with many uh, causes. And uh, I think sometimes we get, we want to be very simplistic and we see some sort of correlation between housing and interpersonal violence or incarceration, or we see a correlation between <laughs> education levels and you know, humans are very inventive at coming up with causal stories when they see patterns like this, but the world often doesn't follow these kind of simple causal patterns. And I think one of the things that happens a lot in our conversations about violence is people uh, attribute to race really, you know, other environmental factors, geographic factors, many of the things that have been discussed over the course of the conversations in this uh, series. And I think that can be very detrimental because it, it represents potentially a, a misunderstanding of uh, the complexity uh, of the problem. And I think it also has helped to fuel some of the decisions, uh, be it by police, by prosecutors, uh, by judges that uh, contribute to some of the things that we see in our country with respect to mass incarceration. May I just chime in too, please, Sarah? Uh, related to that, there's also there's, there's variation in how we respond to different kinds of violence or, or the extent to which we're gonna assign some sort of disciplinary action two kinds of violence. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking of um, what my colleague, uh, Julie Netherland and, and Helen, uh, Helena Hansen at NYU, what they call the war on drugs that wasn't, mm -hmm. which is essentially um, opiate addiction or synthetic opiate addictions among white circles. So heroin for sure, but Vicodin, Oxycontin, and then the Suboxone that's um, then prescribed to help you get off the drugs, right, drugs for the drugs. Um, and how the, the sentiment towards that substance use disorder, first of all, that it's medicalized, right? It's not a pathology um, of the community. It's this person, their Percocet script wasn't well managed, so they're, they're, their addiction is medicalized for one. Um, and two, the, the institutional response is, is one of embrace and one of rehab and care and treatment as opposed to um, punitive and exclusionary. Um, and that in and of itself, I think, is, is a really important way to think about structural violence and race and mass incarceration, is who gets caught up in what ways um, and what kinds of responses, or rather, what is the fallout from the sort of response that you get based on where you come from or what you look like. 
You know, it seems to me that's why it's so important to sort of think the structural and the symbolic and the material together, right? Because once we have an ordering of humanity that is grounded, that was initially grounded in a new economic system, right, that requires a huge amount of labor, some of which um, is here with us, uh, you know, and once those hierarchies are racialized in the way that they were racialized, five years ago and then strengthened at different moments in history. We already have an ideological system mm -hmm. that will map everything in terms of those differences and hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So we can't not see a child holding a, a black, that people cannot see a black child ho holding a toy gun as anything other than mm -hmm. violent or a bag of skills or whatever, right? Because it's so ingrained in the organization of our thinking. Um, you know, that, that these are the representations that circulate and they're the representations that we know. So to get out of that, I think, is so difficult, especially when it's reinforced by the forms of structural inequality that you're talking about. So it really requires a revolution of the mind, you know, and a revolution of the, the institutional structures in which we live. You know, I mean, I like the 68, um, uh, model, you know, in a way because it actually flips the script, right? It's, you know, we're talking about um, uh, the, the uh, re-entrenchment of a, a, a conservative or the, or I guess the re-emergence um, of a conservative state, fascist ideas worldwide, but 68 is a year of movements, mm -hmm. you know? I, I mean, it is that too, but it's a year of movements, so it's sort of, again, that flips the script in, in ways that might be productive. Yeah. Kristen? Yeah, I just wanted to add something really quickly to that because I think w one of the things that makes this conversation at times difficult for us to have is the invisibility of structures. Um, and what makes the structures invisible, what makes the, the mechanisms of our logics invisible, well, a lot of it is, are the ways that history obscures itself. And so many of us don't necessarily see the historical connections, for example, between the Reagan years and the war on drugs and the violence that's happening in Colombia right now, the 50-year war, for example, right? And so we don't make a connection between, say, for instance, what may be happening in North Philly here around drugs and, and abjection in, in, in communities that are marginalized and these historical processes that are both global and expand across time. And so the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because many, if we look at history, many of the things we assume to be common sense can then be analyzed as decisions that were made over time that have a certain political trajectory. And if we could just get a bit of perspective and remove ourselves from the assumptions of common sense, we can start to think about things like race and violence and politics in very new ways that can give us perspective that I think is, is really quite needed right now. So you're jumping ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> because we're going to end the conversation with solutions. So oh, that wasn't like, my solution, but OK. okay. <laughs> it sounded like you were on the way to a solution. Um, but I do want to move to kind of this global mm -hmm. you know, um, phenomenon and the fact that, um, you know, and, and what's interesting, when I was watching the video, I didn't know that story. And um, we are living in such a connected world you know, digitally. And you, you would think that, you know, there would be this global connectivity around these movements. You know, obviously we know very tangibly Black Lives Matter here in America. Um, but clearly there are movements that precede Black Lives Matter that are happening in Brazil. And, mm -hmm. and I know you do work in Jamaica looking at at um, some of the, these, these things that are similar and consistent globally. So I wanted both of you, Deb and Kristen, to talk about your work in looking at state violence and, and movements in Jamaica and Brazil and kind of making that connection with what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So. You want to start? You want to start? Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about your work in Jamaica first? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so the project that I'm working on now comes out of um, uh, something that happened in 2010 in Kingston, Jamaica. In 2009, the US government issued an extradition order for one of the big um, drug, we call them drug dons, uh, in um, a community in downtown Kingston that's known as a quote unquote garrison community. And garrison communities are these communities that uh, have been affiliated to one or the other political party and have been linked with a politician and have been armed by politicians over time. Um, and they will fight each other at election time and whoever party, whoever's party wins is promised you know, uh, contracts or, you know, different kinds of jobs, et cetera, uh, so that that Don then delivers the vote for the, um, for the candidate. And this is, uh, in a way, how politics has been organized um, in Jamaica since independence, though with the drug trade, it took on a whole new level because uh, at that moment, the Don, the informal leader of the community, actually gained more political power and authority in many cases than the legitimate politician with whom he was linked because he had, he had international contacts and he had a commodity that was very valuable. Um, and of course, the relationship between the trade and various other countries puts Jamaica within that um, circuit also. You know, when the police start clamping down in Mexico and Honduras, that's when things start, the, the trade starts getting hot in Jamaica. When the police start cl clamping down in Jamaica, that's when it pops up in El Salvador, Guatemala, et cetera, right? So this is all part of one hemispheric kind of set of um, circulations. Anyway, the US issued an extradition order for uh, Christopher Doris Koch, just as they had for his father uh, before him, decades prior to that, and the night before he was to be extradited, he died mysteriously in a fire in his jail cell. Um, so they issued the extradi uh, extradition order for Dodas in 2009, August, and uh, the government uh, refused. And um, because the prime minister at the time was actually the member of parliament for the community that Doris was running. So he would have been giving up his man. And anybody who's familiar with mob politics, you know, clearly this is not something you want to do, right? Um, anyway, so he dragged his feet and dragged his feet and um, you know, people in legitimate political positions throughout the country were you know, arguing, you can't, you can't do this. You, know, you cannot not extradite somebody that the United States wants on their so, so eventually he authorized the Attorney General to sign the order, uh, went on TV to alert everybody that the you know, army was gonna go into the community looking for coke on the Monday. So of course he amassed his own forces within the community and Monday came a joint operation of the army and the police forces went into this community, Tivoli Gardens, um, and uh, you know, overpowered Doris' army within a few hours and then started going house to house and pulling out all of the men, uh, took them on various kinds of odysseys, subjected them to all kinds of humiliation and torture, um, would shoot up in the sky and say run and then you know, shoot at them as they were running. Just lots of heinous, horrific um, things and the lucky ones ended up in the National Stadium for processing at which point uh, they were fingerprinted and photographed, and the government had not been able to get into this community for a long time. So this was sort of the first census, in a way, that was, um, that was taken. At any rate, the, the end result is that they're admitting to killing 75 people, but community members put the number more at about 200. Um, so that's what we've been working on. We've been working on a multimedia installation about this. People have been coming into a recording studio to talk about their experiences during this operation and um, you know, thinking about what are the different ways that we represent and understand state violence and what are the, what are the different perspectives from which we come to know it and see it. You know, there's the uh, actions of the police, there's the narratives of the people in the communities that we're working on, there's the footage from the US drone that was overhead during the entire operation. There's archival footage of the community. You know, all of these different ways to understand the ways that the state creates uh, and produces violence in communities, right? Uh, 
Um, so that's what I've been uh, working on. And clearly, there are so many points of connection between what's happening in Jamaica and what's happening here, not just at the level of uh, police killing citizens in a country, but also at the, at the interconnections between and among the countries that are experiencing these similar kinds of phenomena. And I think those are the things that are important to um, really think through what those entanglements are. Historically, I mean, you're talking about Reagan, we could go back to Nixon and, and you know that initial iteration of the war on drugs and how it really puts us all in the same boat together whether we recognize it or not. And so it's just to trace what those linkages are and track how they're working over time in the context of those decisions that are made and why they're made the way they're made, what kinds of politics are possible when you're always trying to cater to US uh, economic dictates or the economic dictates of the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. Kristen, Brazil. So, <laughs> so I have been um, collaborating with the organization that you saw in the video since its inception, um, since 2005. And in essence, what we see in Brazil is a systematic um, violent interaction between the state and black people from communities, mostly working class black people from the outskirts of the cities. And so what React or Die has been doing in Portuguese, it's Reajo Será Morta, Reajo Será Morto. What the organization has been doing since 2005 is actually documenting and charting this violence um, bringing it to world attention, national and world attention, and also putting pressure on the government to um, end that violence. And one of the things that I think that has been really quite um, revolutionary about the work that they are doing is that they are de demystifying some of the myths of quote unquote black on black violence in Brazil and particularly around um, drug trafficking. And so for the most part, if you go to Brazil or if you went to Brazil in the Olympics and you turned on the television, what you would have seen in terms of narratives of violence is talking about the drug traffickers and the drug traffickers in the favelas and the ways that they are taking things over and that things are so violent because of drug traffickers. But what the work of Heaja has allowed us to see is that many times what happens is that the police invade communities, they kill young, mostly young black men, although I do also work on the, the impact of this violence on black women, and I can talk about that later if, if people want to hear more about that. But they kill mostly young black men between the ages of 15 and 29, um, similar to our demographics here in the United States. The um, video that you saw, the film that you saw, is one that was produced by an activist and collaborator that work, has worked with Hiaja. Her name is Jihan Hifaz. Um, and one of the things that she talks about there is, are the numbers. The past five years, the, the Brazilian police have killed more people than they've killed in the United States in the past 30. So what is she talking about there? From 2009 to 2014, the Brazilian police, Brazilian police officers killed 11,197 people. That's according to official statistics, mm -hmm. all right? So we are talking about statistics that are voluntarily kept and offered by police forces. Just like here in the United States, the police forces keep their own records about homicides or killings, okay? Um, and so the official records that we have access to, and we only have access to a fraction because only a fraction of police departments will even volunteer the information, gives us a number of 11,197. We can compare that with our similarly deficit numbers here in the United States as gathered by the FBI. If you have been following the conversation around police killings in the United States, you know that our FBI numbers are grossly underreported. For us, and so we're comparing apples with apples, grossly underreported numbers in two countries. For us, over the past 30 years, okay, you have 11,000 people killed by the police in the United States. So that's 11,000 in 30 years or 11,197 in five years. So that will, and remember, we're talking about numbers that are not complete. We're talking about things that have been only partially reported by a police force that does not want to report these numbers. 
And so what we know is that there's a crisis that's happening. And what we also know is that approximately 70% of those who are killed by the police are of African descent, okay? We know that Brazil has a majority black population, majority African descent population, but that is only about 51%. So there's still a disproportionality there that needs to be accounted for. And so one of the things that Heaja has done is really drawn attention to this. I've been working with them since they started around this information gathering and also around working with the communities that are impacted about this, on this violence. Um, the story that was told about Kabula is a, is a particularly emblematic and, and heart-wrenching story. You have a case where the police raided a neighborhood called Kabula. Um, it was actually, the, the section was called Villa Moises. In the middle of the night, they rounded up a group of, a, of approximately 30 young men and they executed and tortured 12. This is a summary execution. What is interesting about this case, however, is that right afterwards, the police actually said that they had been in a gun battle with alleged bank robbers. And so they lied quite directly about what had happened. Um, and the work of Heaja really brought that, that to attention. And so some of the things that they did was they put the young men in military fatigue and took off their bloody clothes in order to pretend that they were part of a criminal faction. And so post-mortem, ipso facto, they actually constructed them as drug traffickers, okay? The reason why I tell this story, and I could go and tell more of it, but I wanna make it short. The reason why I tell this story is that that particular story is part of a pattern and really draws into question the ways that we associate things like drug trafficking with state violence and the way that we justify state violence through the narratives of drug trafficking. If, the, if this story is fabricated, right, and if that is the status quo, then there are many other fabricated stories. And there are many other underreported or misreported stories going on. What does that then tell us about the state's role in the kinds of violence that we see being perpetuated, not only in a place like Brazil, but also a place like the United States or a place like Jamaica? And so my work has been primarily looking at these issues and really trying to unpack and understand how we can think about this better from a global perspective. Because what we also know is that the police that are doing the killing in, the, in Brazil, for example, have had trainings with police in the United States, particularly the NYPD. They have also been trained by the military dictatorship that Brazil had from, the, from 1964 to 1985. And who trained the military officers during the military dictatorship? Well, the School of the Americas. And if you don't know anything about the School of the Americas, then what we, what we know is that the School of the Americas is a US-sponsored school that was teaching military tactics to US-supported governments during the dictatorship era across Latin America. And there, there's a whole Senate report about it, if you're interested. If you just Google School of the Americas, um, you'll find the Senate report that happened about two, 20 years ago at this point um, that really kind of was the expose on this particular pattern. And so the reason why I bring all of these things up is that all of, all of these violences that we're seeing in terms of material violences are very much connected, just like the symbolic violences are connected, just like the structural violences are connected. And so a global perspective gives us um, the tools that we, that we need to be able to understand these phenomena in new ways. Just I mean, on, that, oh, I was just gonna say, on that second to last point too, I mean, you're, you might be interested to know as well that the manual for counterinsurgency action in Iraq and Afghanistan was taken by a Jamaican American military service person for the US military to Jamaica and given to the Jamaican uh, government as a model of how one might use it to invade these garrison communities like mm -hmm. Tivoli Gardens. So the hand is, you know, the, the fingers have, are in many pots. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, I really appreciate uh, that example that you shared. And I think one of the things that this more global perspective can help us to do is to recognize ways that we might be able to further or advance the conversation locally. And I, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, the example that you pointed out is the role of uh, 
you know, democratic organizations in collecting information, publicizing things. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that here in America we have an opportunity to do a lot better at. It's perhaps surprising to many people that if you were to ask today, you know, what, how many police killings of people of color are there in America, we don't actually don't know. know the answer to that. Uh, and, you know, we've made some steps, and I think uh, the media, and it's easy to criticize the media and how they cover these issues in a lot of ways, but this is an area where I think the media has done a lot to try and document and collect more information. And I think one of the ways that we collectively can improve our conversation is by doing the things that you're describing in Brazil, but here at home. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, we're going to get ready to take questions from the audience, so, you know, get ready. Um, I, I mean, we've, we've, we've kind of, um, we've talked about a lot of different things, but I don't feel like there's any closure here, <laughs> you know. Maybe there will be closure through the questions. Um, I do want to ask one question about the media, because I'm in the media, and, and then we'll go to the audience. And so, you know, bringing it back from, you know, overseas to right here at Penn, um, when we look at the recent situation with the black freshmen here at Penn um, and the use of violent images and um, using those images and, and words as a means of intimidation and terror, um, it's not new. But I, I'm curious, and one or two of you can, can answer this, um, what you feel is the role of the media, and in particular social media now, in uh, perpetrating and um, perpetuating violence. Do you mind if I just ask, answer that really quickly? But of course. Because I, I actually have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> 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 because I've, I've, I've written about this a little bit. And part of what I want to demystify is the idea that the circulation of horrific images like the ones we saw with the pen case is something that is really emerging from social media and is not part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen this kind of circulation of images for many, many years. I live in the state of Texas. I live about an hour and a half from, uh, hour and a half drive from the city of Waco, Texas. The city of Waco, Texas was the site of one of the most horrific one of these most horrific lynchings in the history of this nation, where you had a crowd of about 20,000 people come to burn a man alive. One of the things that we forget about lynchings is that they were carnivals. They, people took souvenirs and body parts home. People circulated postcards and photos. People have passed down those heirlooms for many, many years. One of my colleagues just wrote a wonderful piece, excuse me, for the New York Times, Dana Ram, Dana Ram Ramey Berry, um, talking about teaching racial violence in the classroom and having one of our students at the University of Texas raise his hand and say, actually, I have a family heirloom in my attic that is a purse made of human skin, and we've, we've passed it down in our family for generations. So when we see this, what I would call racial eruption, right, um, which is something, a, a term that my colleague Charles Hale uses all the time at University of Texas, um, what happened around these, these images that were terrorizing students here at UPenn um, just, just a few days ago, what we're looking at is a really old tradition that we've had for a very long time. It may look a little different now that it's on Twitter, but at the turn of the century, the new technology was phonograms, and the new technology was photographs. Photo, phonogram, I said it right, phonograms and photographs. And so some of the things that people were doing were recording lynchings so that people could hear the screens of people played over and over, all, all, over and over with headphones on. One of the things that people were doing were taking these photographs that was a new technology. And so when we see things pop out in Twitter and Facebook, we're simply using our new technologies again to perpetuate racial violence. Related to it. Um, I want to dovetail and highlight first that media is big business, right? So with respect to 
which links will get clicked or how long you stay on a certain channel um, or who you tune in for, all of that, it's, it's, it's all derived from, or the content in those spaces is derived from marketing polls and results, right? So, so we dictate what it is we want to see, you know? Um, so the media is not operating in a vacuum. The executive producers, they're responding to, to public culture, our norms and our desires. Um, but also, the, the information that's disseminated through media outlets, you know, they, they don't have a monopoly on communication either. I'm, I'm so happy you brought up Texas and the epicenter of textbook production, okay. where we don't talk about racial violence, not, not just that like racial violence is, is painted or portrayed in X way instead of Y, it's completely erased, right? So the erasure of, a, of American history and of global history um, is often has this lovely revisionist spin, you know, in our classrooms in third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth grade, you know, civics classes, social studies, and these are the folks who go on to be senators. Um, so, so this is this is a problem too around sort of the 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 blame of the responsibility that we place on media outlets without talking about what's happening um, from pulpits, what's happening at the dinner table, and what's happening in classrooms. Because we learn from all these different ways and we absorb these messages in different ways, not just from the media. So, um, any questions? <laughs> I have more. Yes. Oh, uh, thank you. So, when I have um, conversations, probably otherwise known as arguments and fights with family about these type of topics, and I speak to them about our white privilege and the disenfranchised. Um, of um, black and brown people, I feel as though me actually using those words, white, black, brown, kind of only confirmed their feelings of them and us. And so while I've been to all but one of these talks, I feel as though I'm leaving here still with a stunted vocabulary as to how to handle those conversations. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. You know, I think one of um, uh, the really kind of brilliant things about um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book is that he continuously said the people who believe they are white instead of saying white people, right? Playing with language, like using a word like raciality instead of race. You know, I think things that draw attention to the, to the um, and, and jolt one out of the taken for grantedness of how we categorize um, people, I think, are finding sort of innovative ways to do that. I mean, these are embedded and entrenched modes of thinking and categories of analysis, so it's, it's on all of us, I think, and this is what one of the um, questions was last week, too, like how do we come up with a different language in order to address our most pressing issues? And I think you've hit it, you know, right there. I would just say you gotta just keep struggling with it. And don't stop having the conversations just because you don't have the language. Oh, I'm not. That's what I would say. I mean, I mean, I, that's all. I mean, I, I'm sure you're not, but I, that's all I would say. Uh, uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Demetrius Robinson. I'm a proud member of uh, WRD um, and also a student of history. Um, I had a, a question that my son asked me one day when we were going over his history homework. And he, he said, well, son, um, father, um, how come you had white people who made up a small population of the world was able to colonialize most of the world? And I explained to him when studying history that at one time in Europe, it was tribalism. And it was very little resources in Europe. And what happened was the technology that developed, developed around violence. Um, and once that violence expanded, so did exploration. Um, and what I equated with, with this discussion is, you know, you have violence that is, is learned um, within the black community currently. Because a lot of times, like you mentioned, people say that um, black people are her inherently violent. The difference that I gave, the example that I gave my son and today is, you know, in Europe, they were able to expand. And when resources were obtained, they were able to share it. And once they shared resources, they were able to negotiate amongst themselves. And even in traveling and expanding, they became white instead of uh, French or Irish. And then it was a them against us. 
in the black community, unfortunately, you know, we, we learned, to, uh, 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 learned violence. Uh, we, we're, we're taught violence. And I guess my question is, is there a study that looks at how we only adopt, we just not only adopted language, culture, but adopted violence and just wasn't introduced to violence, but was given the tools, but with policing was not allowed to expand and with racism not allowed to obtain resources? So that's a, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I think that, that the question that your son asked is a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. Um, and your answer sounded great. Who wants to take that, Erin? Yeah, so your second question, is there a study that exists? Yes, forthcoming from Stacy Patton um, at uh, Morgan State University in Baltimore. She's a historian in the School of Journalism and she's writing a book, I believe it's called Spare the Rod. Um, and essentially what it does is chronicle the ways in which black parents internalize um, lessons, if you will, miss around um, children's inferiority, that children are born into sin, that they have to be broken and mended, um, made into manageable little people, um, and all of that is derivative of the transatlantic slave trade and, and needing to make folks conform and starting that process sooner and sooner and sooner. Um, and, and there's contemporary relevance, too, to that study when we look at um, Toya Graham is her name, who was named Mother of the Year. She snatched up her son at the Mondawmin Mall riots um, in Baltimore following Freddie Gray's death. Um, and, and she was striking him, and this is all on TV, and she was on all the talk shows and everything, and there was this idea of like black parents, um, just knee-jerk sort of response to discipline or administrating discipline is through violence, right? And this idea that it's learned that we can't do any better. And a lot of a lot of um, backlash, if you will, from black parents themselves said, well, what this really does, what Toya Graham's behavior does is typify the urgency that black parents feel around preserving their children's lives. Like, I'd rather it be me than this officer, or I'm going to give you a taste of the lash or fear so that you know well enough to stay out of situations that would raise suspicion or present you as a risky subject, all of which is problematic, let me be clear. Um, but it's, it's, a different, it's a different argument from just sort of like an innate, concrete, blunt way of thinking around violent behavior or resorting to violent behavior or violent mechanisms as a, as a, as a specifically black phenomenon. It's, it's definitely rooted in other sorts of practices and other sorts of teachings um, that have a historical legacy. Can I just say something yeah. else Please. to that really quickly? I think that part of what Part of, what, part of what I always um, feel in terms of a, a little bit of concern when we start to talk about violence in our communities is the following. The violence that our communities have experienced from the outside far outpaces any violence that our communities have produced interpersonally, intracommunally. And I always like to kind of insert that in the conversation because I think that the pathologization of the black family is such that when we start to talk about the violence that happens in families and talk about um, the mother in Baltimore who won mother of the year because our nation thought that that was the right way for black mothers to parent, right? Um, some of that kind of glosses over the, the real harsh terror mm -hmm. that we have had to live. And I just want to underscore that because although that may be apparent for some of us, it may not be apparent for all of us. That's right. And, and, and I just want us to make sure that we're very, very careful about recognizing that the kinds of violence that we see within the black community are produced by a level of terror that is simply astronomical. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has been, you know, has, has been put upon us over time. And so you have a black mother that is, is, is hitting her child in public, but we can't compare that to a Tamir Rice, for example, right? Where you have a black child that's executed by the police in less than 30 seconds. And so I just, I just want to say that. No, that's that urgency. Years of slavery. Right. Yeah. That's the urgency. Absolutely. You're right. 
Thank well, you. And I don't, I don't know if anyone could answer his son's question. How did, how did this small group of people dominate the world? I think he answered his yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Next. <laughs> Uh, yeah, He's been waiting. Uh, in terms of uh, like in terms of social science theories, whether you, there, there's ever been a study to deal with uh, this higher if there's since we see higher rates of autism and like different types of other types of, of uh, things that may be a disorders, whether that leads to higher rates of violence as those children like as those children start to become adults. If you see higher rates of violence, if they had autism or they've had like something like ADHD as a child, mm -hmm. okay. Oliver, do you want to yeah. answer that? Um, so I would say that there's probably a lot of ongoing studies about that because people are really interested in that. Uh, I think so. The work that I do is is, is a lot on looking at people who think about um, the uh, neurological basis of violence, and so part of what or neuropsychological basis of violence, important. So part of what they're really interested in then is uh, what happens, how we raise our, how children are raised, and then whether or not, you know, over time it does lead to particular types of violence. And part of that, that conversation, mental illness always comes into that conversation. And so, yes, there are, but I, I would also be really cautious about how we read those things as well, because um, there, I mean, the, most of these folks are neuropsychologists who are thinking about this, and there is, absolutely something to, to say around whether or not mental illness or I would say trauma, particularly like just, just piggybacking on, on this last conversation around the way that the trauma within the black community or the trauma within Latino communities, trauma within Muslim American communities, how that will affect you down the road and whether or not then that gets diagnosed as ADHD or that gets diagnosed as a particular type of illness that goes that that then say is related to violence so I think that's one avenue we have to think about and the other thing is that we should not automatically lump particular mental illness to violence right so we, we tend to do that with folks who have schizophrenia we tend to do that with a lot of different things but I don't think we should automatically link those things together so these scientists would argue that what they try to link together is whether or not there's risk factors for having ADHD that may may in fact lead you to be more violent down the road. But there is no definitive way of answering it. The only but, way you can answer but, it is to uh, say you may have more risk factors. One thing I've heard from a psychologist that what they noticed is that inside the prison, that the prison was more of a mental hospital. Yeah. And that you have a lot of people that have serious types of mental illnesses that happen to be incarcerated. Yeah. Well, and that these types of issues aren't dealt with. Absolutely. Uh, can, you know, yeah. at that level. I, and I would say, so I, I would say, so during, during the, the research that I was doing, one of the things that I did that was interesting is I was, inter I was interviewing neuroscientists here and interviewing neuroscientists outside of the U.S. who had worked here at some point in time, who were either studying psychopathy, studying antisocial behavior, studying conduct disorder. And I asked these scientists who were outside, who were either in Germany uh, or um, the U.K., uh, what was the difference in working in the two different areas? And the first thing that they say, one, is that America is the most violent place I've ever been in my life. Right, they just say because of guns and it's like it's just way more violent than studying this anywhere else. But the second thing is they say is that it's not that our prisons actually operate or our mental health institutes, but that they don't pay attention to mental health issues. That they end up being a proxy way in which we deal with mental health issues, but it's a horrible way of dealing with mental health issues because we really don't do it there. So we either over medicate or we ignore. Whereas for them, they argue when they do their work in Europe. Uh, the people who are diagnosed with the mental illnesses that they're looking for, like let's say antisocial behavior, are not actually in the prisons. They're in mental health hospitals that are already separated. So we have, a, you are absolutely correct, we do have a problem where we already have collapsed our, our prison system into our mental health system. Now, a problem that I have to face with though, because of a lot of what these, the, a lot of what these scientists want to do is say, well, maybe we should start treating this more as a mental illness again. But then we know from the 1950s and 60s that we also had a problem with the ways in which mental institutions operated. So it's not simply that we want to go back to that, but I do think you absolutely hit on something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we have to um, take the, le the next few questions and if you can make them very succinct and direct, that would be great. So we'll go with you and then we'll go to the other side. Yes. Uh, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to make the comment that I, I, I love the sciences and I wish that uh, more people without or with an understanding of bias were more active in our in our social media and, and the media landscape. Um, 
but my, my question is more about culture. Um, and since there's just, you know, not much of a biological basis of race, we're mostly talking about culture. I, I'm interested in the, how, how you guys feel about um, the problem of owning a culture and protecting it as a diverse, a problem of diversity where you have, um, you know, the, the feeling of being under attack or threatened uh, in some way. And, um, and, and how you own your own bodies and, and cultures and operate in this world that is now so fluid and um, just how, what, what your feelings on, on the, the social science in that field. Who wants to answer that s quickly? Well, I, I guess I would say that um, one of the things I think that has happened in social scientific and popular discourse is that as we moved away in the 1960s uh, from a sort of um, static biological definition of race, the new language that came in to replace it was culture, right? And so culture just became a proxy for race. So I would rephrase the question, I suppose, to talk instead about social processes that produce um, the ways that people are marginalized and uh, the ways that particular kinds of attributes and behaviors and philosophies <coughs> are being attributed to them and not see it as something that's part of uh, a static um, kind of cultural makeup because that has been something that's been leveled against black populations throughout the world for the last 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. We've had a culture of poverty, we've had a culture of violence, but, you know, it's, it's, it's only race talk, but in different language. You know? So I think we just turn that language around. So we're gonna, if, if we can take these last three questions, you can ask them like right after each other and then they'll respond to them um, after you all three ask your questions. Okay. So I've come to every class and in every class I've heard that race cannot be biologically proven. So my question becomes, in a country where I have been given a race and told that that's what I am, how, what, what is my hope? for the future or moving forward and raising my child or just living publicly in a country where anybody who looks like me, the history of this country, we have been treated as inferior due to what other people think of themselves. How, how do I move forward in life knowing that Brazil can happen and people are gonna cover up and give us whatever numbers they want and just constantly, this is the narrative of people that look like us here and globally. How do we move forward? Great, yes. Okay. Um, I guess this doesn't have a simple answer, and I don't expect one, but with all of your <laughs> academic studies, do you see a prescriptive way to approach the, the coming years with the legislative, judicial, and executive branch leaning so far? to the right, and with the advent of new judges, new restrictions, I'm thinking that the, the police, you know, interactions and other social interactions will have a blessing of sorts. And okay. what's your plans with your um, studies to address that in the future? Okay. okay. Yes. So real, real quick, I think that this whole uh, conversation of race and violence is spurious because I think that we humans are violent, and what's the explanation for? Um, I can't hear the question. Is there a biological basis for us as humans being violent? I'm sure that there are Jewish people who, if we lived several decades ago, we'd be having this conversation about the Jews um, and how they were treated by the Germans. So, is there a biological basis for the violence that we humans? Uh, perpetrate against each other is just over time you have these different groups so today in America and in other parts of the world it's black versus white but like I said uh, several decades ago 
uh, in, um, in over in Europe, it was the Jews being um, uh, uh, victims of violence for the Germans. We can go back even further than that for different groups in like uh, World War I with Europe fighting against each other, World War II. So, so is there a biological basis for, for us humans uh, as a species um, being violent? Okay, well why don't we start with that question. Um, and I know Oliver, you yeah, kind of it. touched on it um, earlier, but you yeah, can get into so, it. Um, I mean, to answer the question, even as a human species, I, I, so one that's very convoluted, but I would say my answer would still be no. And the reason it would be no is because I, I, we can't think about each other, we can't think about violence as an identity that we just hold on to. There is no such thing as just a violent person or a peaceful person. Violence is a longer scale, peacefulness is a longer scale, all of these things are a longer scale. So to say that there's a biological basis to it, I, I think would be somewhat off. Now, we could absolutely say that there could be people who have, let's say, a particular mental illness or things like that. They may act more violent based on, and that could be a biological cause to that. But to say that there's some innate biological cause to humanness, I think, has been problematic. And that's really what social, sociologists and anthropologists have been fighting back against with biological theories, particularly theories around evolution, because many of these theories end up getting rooted back into, uh, into racism. So when we talk about an evolutionary, ish, an evolutionary basis of violence, uh, we end up having discussions around intelligence. And so this ends up to being a, a, a conversation around intelligence and who can actually hold in their feelings and who can't, who can control their bodies and who can't. And so these end up being coded in racialized language anyway. And so what you end up seeing then also is that there is no biological marker that you can find across humans that could explain why one human would act in one way or another. Right? So even if we took people out of the prisons, we couldn't just find some biological cause to all the reasons why they were in prison because it's varied reasons why people get in prison. It's varied reasons why people act violent. Yeah, th I just want to add too that, um, I mean, I think the question to ask is what is at stake in defining it biologically? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. like, why do Absolutely. people why do we insist coming on coming back to a science? that there must be a science to it instead of investigating it in historical and sociological terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's the, th that's the question to ask. And I just want to um, address your question because that was actually my question when I first was asked to, to moderate this, um, this panel, like, really race and violence, you know? But I think that when you, I think that it's, it's um, you can't get away from the, the the way that race is used and, and has been a tool to exact violence on certain racial groups. And so I think this has been a really you know, interesting and informative conversation, even if it's uncomfortable, um, putting it within the framework of, of this, this topic of race and violence in the, in the context of this larger conversation about biology and, and race or medicine and race. So, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of your discomfort, at least that's what I'm taking from it, with the, the general concept. But we're going to end with the two questions because they, they kind of lead into, like, you know, what do we take away from this? So the, the last two questions I'm going to kind of blend into one because, you know, we are living in this new normal, this, this very right-wing, you know, somewhat fascist world um, with the... The, the new president-elect and who he's surrounding himself, like Steve Bannon, and people who you know, have self-proclaimed very um, racist ideologies. So you know, based on your, your, your studies and your, your um, research, how do you see us moving forward in, um, in the future? And what the sister asked, um, you know, this, what inspiration, what hope does she have when we talk about what a racist society we live in, even though there's no biological basis for race, she's still walking through this world in a black body that has consequences. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what do you tell her and us about how that, that what does, how does she do that? So it's a twofer. I mean, I, I you know, I have one thought in terms of where we go from here. I think one of the challenges with the 
surprise of uh, what happened with the election and some of the events in the immediate aftermath is it becomes so easy to focus on the ways in which our viewpoints differ from other people within our society on some of these issues. But, you know, I do have some hope that I think that there are areas, you know, despite the very real differences of opinion that people have, there are areas where it may still be possible to find common ground and be able to make progress. We referred earlier in the conversation to the problem of mass incarceration, which I think is a very difficult one, but it's also one that if we actually look at the data in the past few years, we've gone down and there are actually fewer prisoners today nationwide than there were a while ago. And part of what's contributed to that trend, I think is a confluence of people who have differing ideolo ideologies who have been able to kind of come together, people from the right focusing on the fiscal consequences of imprisonment, people from the left focusing on uh, the in injustices and the inequalities and the structural factors that lead to that, but in the end making some progress on that problem. And I think there are other areas where we may be able to find that common ground, but it's gonna take a lot of work of each of us to be able to identify those. Aaron? Mine is spinning. <laughs> um, where's my friend in the Penn State sweatshirt? I have my goggles on. Yeah, I can't. Okay, sorry, because the light is right on me. Um, what I'll tell you directly, and something I think about, and I recognize my privilege as as a U.S. citizen, as a straight woman, as a property owning, educated, blah 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 blah, like go down the list, able bodied, you know, all of these things. Um, but I do wear black skin, just like you wear black skin. And the way I think about it as far as like, what do I do with this black skin that I've been given, even though everyone's telling me it's not meaningful, but we know that it is, um, is to remember that when you have everything to lose, you have nothing to lose. <laughs> so to, to be really unapologetic and really brave in your black skin um, is the best advice I can give you, and, and to use that as a guiding sort of framework, like you are a living testimony of your excellence and then move forward in that way in everything that you do as best that you can and to seek out other folks who will support that mandate and initiative I think is really, really important. Um, and then with respect to our friend's question just after you around um, how to move forward and I hesitate to out myself because I have two <laughs> grant proposals under review right now. But sometimes you just have to steal their language <laughs> and by their, so folks are not as interested in Toya Graham's sheer terror, right? The urgency she feels to snatch up her son while cameras are rolling to spare his life or to save him from what she believes would be imminent doom at the hands of someone else. But they are interested in reproductive justice, right? <laughs> so the idea that you have the right to see your child live and live healthily, health, a healthy life. Um, you know, that's kind of the way I'm spinning my stuff. And like I said, I'm going to be quiet because I got to wait to see if I get this money. <laughs> but I have found that, you know, like these, these strange bedfellows that we have in business, you know, the, the sort of most vocal proponents of the United Nations, the, the five biggest countries are also the, the biggest arms dealers, you know, Koch brothers who you would think, why do you care about mass incarceration or mass criminalization? Um, oops, they've been super, super active, you know, in defunding, um, um, these entities. So, so thinking sort of really broadly around coalition building does not mean selling out. It just means being creative perhaps with, <laughs> with who you partner um, and how you frame your agenda. Because at the end of the day, you have to get done what you have to get done. And there are fewer of us than there are of them. So I just feel like that's okay. When I go to bed at night and I think about the way I wrote up my narrative or my agenda, again, speaking from a privileged academic perspective and position, um, I still feel like I'm tr being true to my black skin and the black folks for whom I'm fighting. So that's a way that I think about moving forward. I think on a, on a psychic level, too, um, you know, I think we just have to remember that in the most dire of situations, people have always made life, you know? And there's been always a value on maintaining life. Sorry. And I think that's what we have to hold on to. You know? And I've been singing Sweet Honey like all week. You know? yeah. <laughs> but I think that's, you know, 
it, it's been worse than this, and people have lived, you know, and that's, like, we can't dishonor that by not doing the same thing. Sorry. Yeah, no, okay. you're beautiful. I don't, yeah, I don't... <laughs> yeah. All, all evening, I've been looking down at my ancestors laying out in front of me. And all evening, I've been hearing them say, symbolically, if you will, that part of what, part of the reason why we're in this right now, to the sister that asked the question, is because we want to be comfortable and we want to pretend like everything's okay when it's not. And I really, I really want to emphasize and, and remind us that pretending that race doesn't exist won't make it go away. Mm -hmm. Pretending like slavery never happened won't make it not have repercussions today. Pretending that we don't have a deep racial divide in this country that just manifested in this election will not make things better. And so instead of seeking to avoid that conversation and those feelings that are uncomfortable and are difficult, I firmly believe that we have to engage in a form of radical honesty right now because it is radical dishonesty that got us in this mess. And so part for me, quite frankly, I believe that we need to be talking about the things that divide us. We need to be talking about race. Yes, it's not a biological reality, but it sure as heck is a social construct that has real life consequences on our lives every day, both historically and contemporarily. And it has violent consequences on our lives because what you look like has a direct relation to how long you live in this world mm -hmm. and whether or not your children will see tomorrow. And so yes, we have to talk about it. And yes, it's not comfortable. And yes, it's painful. But you know what? We cannot, and I'll say what I said before, we cannot bury it anymore because if you bury it, they're gonna rise up through the earth and they're gonna tell us anyways. And so to me, we need radical honesty. We need radical honesty and we need to start to really heal some of our wounds. Part of the reason why we keep having the same conversation over and over again, meaning in the aftermath of Reconstruction, meaning in the aftermath of Jim, Jim Crow, meaning in the aftermath of this, the, the civil rights movement, meaning in the aftermath of the election of the first black president. The reason why we have these conversations over and over again, where we swing this way and then we swing all the way back the other way, is because we want to pretend that we are something that we are not. And we cannot keep doing that. And I think that I would really love for this to be the moment when we actually start to try to deal with our problems rather than pretending like someone like Bannon is not a white nationalist. And, and what, do we, what do we earn? One of the things I said to my students on Monday was the following. People are talking about compromise and people are talking about negotiating and dialoguing. But the terms, of the, conversation are the, the terms of the conversation are the following. Some people believe that I am not a human being. I believe that I'm a human being. What exactly can we compromise on in that conversation? Where is the compromise? And that is something that I really think that, you know, we're not, we're not really talking, we're not being honest about it. We're, we're talking about economics, and we're talking about people feeling upset about the economy. Yes, but there's also the race. This was also a racial divide. Go home and look at the election results based on race and see how that breaks down and ask hard questions about what that means. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have hope. I went, I'm a proud graduate of Wilson Senior High School in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to let you know that the current students at Wilson, along with all the other D.C. public school students that walked out yesterday of their classrooms and marched down the streets of Washington, D.C., saying, we will not let bigotry stand, made me proud. Because they are part of a long legacy of the refusal to allow authoritarianism and reactionary behavior 
to stop us from dreaming, from fighting back, etc. So is there hope? Absolutely. We have to fight. We have to fight for what we believe in. Yeah. I think that's a good place to stop. Yeah. You guys okay with that? Yes. Yeah? Um, let's thank our phenomenal panel. <laughs> I think, I mean, I have this quote from Martin Luther King about violence. Yeah. Should I read it? Yeah, please. Okay. It's the long version. You guys have heard the very end. Okay. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder the hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate, so it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.